What's up, everybody? It's Matt. This is the 10 Minute Bible Hour. And in this video, I want to tackle two questions. One, who are the Magi from Matthew chapter 2 in the account of Jesus' birth? And two, why is that story even in the Bible? It's so weird. And there's such strange characters. You might be like, oh, yeah, I think I know about this. I have a nativity set. We sang about that at Christmas. I've been digging into it. I'm telling you, this is so much more interestinger than I thought, and I'm excited to talk about it with you. So let's get after it. Who were the Magi? Why are they in the Bible? The best way to get a sense of everything that happened in this story in Matthew chapter 2 is to pause this and just go read Matthew chapter 2. But if you don't want to do that, you can just hang out with me for a second and I'll give you the terrible paraphrase version. It goes like this. Jesus gets born and then there's this star that these magi see in the east and they're like, that is compelling enough that we're going to pack up all of our stuff and we're going to go try and find this king. And so they travel and they do find a king, but it's just not the right king. They go to the place where a king would be in any given nation, which is the capital. In this case, it's the province of Judea under Roman rule. And they run into the Roman stool pigeon king who was despised by his subjects and the original audience, who was known for being maniacal and deranged and violent and insecure. This is Herod the Great. And they're like, hey, you probably heard about this king that's going to be born. Like, surely everybody knows about that. Could you just point us to where he got born? Because surely everybody knows. And Herod's like, what? Yes, another king that was to be born that was predicted from days of yore? Great. Hey, could I have you guys just wait in that other room for a second? I had something else that just came up that's totally unrelated to your visit. Just a second. And they're like, oh, okay. And then a little bit of paraphrasing here. Herod's like, brings in all of his Bible guys and his advisors and scholars and everything. He's like, okay, what, how does this work? There's supposed to be a Messiah or King or something is born. Where's he supposed to be born? And they're like, oh, well, you know, Micah five says that he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem of Judea. And Herod's like, okay, great. Uh, yeah, I bring the guys back in. The Magi come back in. He's like, that is such super news. What sitting King wouldn't be thrilled to hear that another King has recently been born. If you find him, could you just make sure to tell me where he is so that I can go and worship him too? And the Magi are like, sure, buddy, no problem. You seem great and like you wouldn't kill any babies at all. And so then they go off to Bethlehem and they find the baby and the holy family there and they bring gifts of frankincense and myrrh and gold. And this is why we sometimes think that there are three wise men or Magi, even though the text doesn't say there are three, you just got the three gifts. So you're like, oh, maybe each of them had one gift. And then they get warned in a dream, something they were apparently pretty attentive to, not to go back to Herod. And so they take a different route back to their home. And then Herod finds out and completely melts down and decides that, well, okay, I just wanted to kill one baby. Now I'm going to have to kill them all. So he decides to kill all of the babies under a certain age. This is how we know that the Magi probably weren't there as the nativity sets depict it. They probably got there when Jesus was just a little bit older. And then Joseph gets warned in a dream to get out of Dodge. I think Joseph probably used the money from the resources he just got from those gifts from the Magi. And he used that, I think, to pay for a trip to Egypt. Then eventually Herod the Great dies and then Joseph and his family return. And then you get the rest of the New Testament. That's the story the text gives us. And I think if we look a little closer, we can piece together a few more things that we can say we know about who the Magi were. One, they were clearly astrologers. They thought there was an order to nature and that somehow something from beyond gave signs and hints as to the big important stuff that was going to happen through the unfolding of history. And they saw some kind of star and it was a big enough deal to them that it motivated them to action. Now, I think just from that detail in the biblical text, we can also figure out that they were a part of an ancient class. I cannot imagine like Donnie and Carl and Dave got together and were like, we should start an astrology club, guys. And they started keeping a few charts. And then like six months later, they were like, I think we've seen enough about the eternal movement of the heavenly bodies to probably fund this trip. It definitely makes sense. No, they must have had centuries, maybe even millennia of charts and data about what was going on up there for an appearance of a star that didn't move the needle for anybody else that we have on record to have been so glaring and outstanding to them that they were like, we got to go. This is that big a thing. Three, I think we can deduce from the text that they must have had access to and looked closely at the Hebrew scriptures. 
they might have come across Micah 5, which is cited in Matthew 2, that says the baby's going to be born in Bethlehem in Judea. Maybe they didn't know exactly where Bethlehem is, and that's why they had to ask Herod. I mean, I don't know if they had signs, like literally street signs back then. But maybe they were also picturing numbers clear back from the other end of the Old Testament, where you get that very specific language about a star coming out of Jacob and a scepter being risen up out of Israel. I mean, there's your star. There's your king. It's pretty overt. That passage alone might have been enough for them to justify making the trip. But then you've got Isaiah 18, where you get this language about a smooth-skinned people from a far-off feared land divided by rivers who come and bend the knee to this king in Zion. Maybe they looked at that and they're like, hey, we got smooth skin. We got rivers. And our land was formerly feared. And maybe he's talking about us. Maybe they got to Isaiah chapter 60 and to this language about this caravan of camels that comes through and how the, the emissaries from a faraway place come and bring gifts of frankincense and gold, frankincense and myrrh. It's two of the three that gets mentioned right there. And maybe through a combination of of their historical astrology that had been going on for a very long time and their read on the Hebrew scriptures, they did the math on all of this and were so convinced of oracles and prophecy that they were like, we got to go take this trip, not just to see what is going on, but I wonder if maybe they even felt like they needed to participate in what was going on because somehow they viewed all of this as something they had a role to play in. Well, that's just what we can deduce from inside the text. Then if we go outside the text, we get into tons of accounts of magic and specifically magi in the ancient world. Now, by the time we get around to the era of Jesus, in the Mediterranean world, you have magic users. We got all kinds of scrolls of spells and different things like that floating around. These things would be associated with parlor magicians, tricks that would be done in marketplaces, cheap little curses that would be cast to get other people to fail at sports. I mean, there's one we have that specifically curses somebody's racehorse so somebody will win at the tracks. Those people will, were held in low regard and we're not talking about that. But for hundreds of years before the time of Christ, we have all kinds of details about this ancient class of people who had their finger on the pulse of this arcane knowledge that nobody else got to know about, who played a significant role in the courts of the most powerful people in the ancient world. One Greek historian in particular, a guy named Diogenes Laertius, writes, while the Magi spend their time in the worship of the gods and sacrifices and in prayers, implying that none but themselves have the ear of the gods, further, they practice divination and forecast the future, Okay, declaring that the gods appear to them in visible form. Moreover, they say the air is full of shapes which stream forth like vapor and enter the eyes of keen-sighted seers. And then they go on to talk about Aristotle, who is cited as believing that the Magi tradition can be traced all the way back to ancient Egypt. So Aristotle is maybe building a bridge here between the Magi that we encounter in Matthew and the court magicians in Pharaoh's court during the time of the Exodus. Early on in the book of Daniel, this same exact word is used to describe Magi. Well, where does that happen? Persia. It's in the east. Well, Babylon and Persia. And so this is not a new thing, is the point. And these are not conjurers of cheap tricks. These were significant court officials who almost played a role similar to what the prophets of the Old Testament did for the kings in the northern and southern kingdoms that we encounter there. They were people of esteem. They were people with ambitions. They were people with power. There's a gigantic, famous, important inscription in northern Iran that you can still go look at today if you can make your way to Iran. And that inscription includes this cryptic little reference to some magi who claimed to be descended from Cyrus the Great, the first great king of Persia, and used that claim to try to overthrow Darius, the current king of Persia. So they had ambitions. It would seem that they almost operated beyond the regular scope of the law. And if that's the case, then I think all of that gets us closer to answering question number two, which is why is this in the Bible? Well, if that's the reputation that this kind of magi held, having those guys come and show up and bend the knee to Jesus is a massive affirmation to people who are kind of on the fences and have some different notions about what is authoritative and what is not 
All of that would really validate Jesus in their minds. But further, there's a validation that occurs because they're not Jews. These Gentile space wizards from far, far away, they could see it. But the supposed actual king of the Jews who actually has the title, he can't see it. And this advances this motif that is introduced in this passage and recurs throughout the book of Matthew, that the ones who are theoretically blind and ill-positioned to see the truth of God can see it, and that the ones who theoretically have a great perch and are oh so enlightened and informed and should know everything about religion and how God is, they're the ones who are actually blind. The third reason I think this is in the text is this motif of Jesus being a blessing to all the nations. All the way back in the Old Testament, there's this promise to Abraham that God's going to make a great nation out of him and that all the nations will be blessed through him. And then here, who shows up at the birth? Gentiles, outsiders, saying that what Jesus is there to do and fulfill and complete is not yet another regional ethnic God. Every group's got one. No, no, no. This is the God. This is the big thing. This is what all of heaven and nature sing about. And even the outsiders, though they might not be able to put precise language to it, can tell this is the king, the promised king. And finally, I think this passage is in here because it introduces a story arc that gets completed in the crucifixion, and that is that the Jewish leadership wants Jesus dead. Now, in this situation, he's delivered, but eventually they get their way. This is a fascinating group of people who vastly predate this age, maybe going back to the beginning of recorded history as the holders of some kind of secret knowledge, and all of their searching and yearning leads them to a place where the divination, the stars, all point to this little baby in this manger. When we take a closer look at what the Bible and history has to say about the Magi, we appreciate the potency of this moment and what's happening in Matthew chapter 2 all that much more. I'm Matt. This is the 10-Minute Bible Hour. Let's do this again soon. The world of the Magi, why are they in the Bible?